Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Once again, I'm having a blast. I brought up Tertullian, and then I said, you know what? It seems like we've got some Orthodox heretics, people that seem to be on the right path, like Origen seemed to be on the right path, and then, whoa, hold on, this guy went into some dangerous areas. He shouldn't have gone. I don't know. He might be a heretic. What's a heretic? And then maybe tell <laughs> us about... Well, the word heresy means choice, and, and it is a label that people use when they disagree. Right? Now, look at Christians today, okay? We've got Baptist, Pentecostalist, Russian Orthodox, Roman Catholics. Um, who have I left out? I mean, many. Methodists, Presbyterians, um, Quakers, uh, Mormons. They call each other heretics, don't they? And in the early Christian movement, that label was used very freely when people disagreed. So then you have someone who's considered one of the great founders of the Christian church. He was a convert to Christianity in North Africa. We don't know whether his family was Roman or native African. His name is Tertullian. He was trained as a barrister, probably in the law. He grew up in the second century, and he became a famous Christian teacher. And he, he's the one who says, I'm going to define what's orthodox for you. Uh, he wrote a prescription against heresy. He said, heresy, it's poison. It's like a scorpion. You know, scorpion stings you. You can die of the poison. And, and heresy is poison. So just you have to avoid it at all costs. The way you avoid it is you, you take what I'm telling you. I call it the regula fide because I'm speaking Latin. Um, rule of faith, okay? You know, Jesus is the Son of God. You know, he was born of a virgin. Uh, he was crucified and died and ra rose bodily in the flesh. That's the rule of faith, okay? That's what we know. You've got to believe that. And when you believe that, you have to stop and stop believing everything else because all these heretics have terrible ideas and they, they let women, you know, celebrate the Eucharist. They, they're just... They talk about their visions. They talk about spiritual depth. Avoid that stuff. Later in his life, Tertullian was called a heretic because he joined a group that had been reading the Apocalypse of John from the New Testament and became convinced it was a revival movement. In the year 160 to 170 in North Africa and, and parts of Asia Minor, part of the Roman Empire, um, a prophet came and other prophets with him saying, the time is coming. Jesus is coming back. The new Jerusalem is going to happen. The kingdom of God is about to come right now. And these prophets spoke that and preached it in churches all over the world at the time. Tertullian became convinced, this charismatic Christian movement, the kingdom of God is coming now, very, very soon. He joined that. And therefore, for that reason, he himself was called a heretic by the Orthodox. And then he called them people who just didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, I think you said in your book that they were just kind of uh, bishops who just go through the motions almost like they, they, they get baptized. There's no real experience. Yes, he, well, somebody called them dry canals. I mean, you know, th you think they're full of living water, but they're just, they're all dried up and they don't know what they're doing. So Tertullian then attacked the Orthodox Church on that ground. <laughs> so this is a very fluid term. Heretic can mean anyone you don't like. I mean, if you are a certain kind of Christian, in any group that anyone who's with us today can speak about, you could call those people who say they're Christians heretics because they're interpreting things differently. I, I love it because he was, and I suspect he still was against the Gnostics, if you could use the term as they like to use it, uh, even in his later years. Yes. 
However, because I mean, the, the Gnostics, depending on the teaching, and you point out there's a lot of different people with different views, um, the kingdom was now. They're not waiting for the kingdom. The kingdom is now. They had the kingdom, or they were, they were kind of the embodiment of the kingdom of God. Yes, although the group he joined was, was convinced that, that the message of Jesus, that the kingdom was coming soon in Judgment Day, they were expecting it to come very soon in their own time, mm -hmm. um, as many people have ever since. I think it's amazing how he's interpreting Revelation yes. to 160s, the 180s, 80s. Absolutely. It was called a charismatic revival movement. It wasn't, it wasn't different viewpoints. It was just the sense that what Jesus said would happen at the end of time is now. Hmm. And, that, and that movement was later called heresy by the church. And bishops tried to exorcise demons from the prophets who, who gave that kind of teaching. So, Tertullian, before we get off at him, because he's an interesting fellow, he was he one of the major players on the what the canon should be? Uh, or what, what specifically did Tertullian do? Well, he spoke about the rule of faith. Now, you know, Derek, he's living in about the year 160 to 200, right? right. That is a long time before you have a canon. You don't have a canon for 200 years more. Even 150 years after Tertullian, people are arguing about what should be in the New Testament. And the only reason they're doing that is that suddenly something astonishing happens. Instead of being persecuted for being Christians in the Roman Empire and suspect by the Roman authorities, there's an emperor who suddenly became a Christian himself, right? Constantine. Mm. And the world changed overnight, not overnight, over a f maybe a few decades, because they didn't have instant communication in those days. But when Constantine became a Christian and the emperor of the Roman world, he went to a bishop and said, OK, so get me a copy of your sacred writings. And the bishop, Eusebius, said, all right, but which ones? Which ones do we put in the sacred writings that we're going to call the New Testament? So Eusebius sort of takes a poll of the most popularly read books. There were books like the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke. Those are read a lot. Gospel of John, Gospel of Thomas, these are all widely read. And letters of Paul, letters of James, letters of Peter. Are they authentic? There are questions about that. Which letters of Paul are authentic? questions about that. So he's, he puts together a collection and says, well, these are the books that people agree on. And then these are books that are still controversial and that aren't agreed upon. He put the book of Revelation actually into both categories, the agreed upon books and the heretical books. But the point was that many bishops' councils met and said, all right, which ones do you think should go in? And a lot of people agreed on the ones that were most widely read, like Paul's letters, the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, that's well known. What about the letter of James? Is it really James who wrote it? What about the letters that Paul may have written and maybe didn't write, like 1 Timothy? There's dispute about those. But you, it's not until the year 400 or so that you get a clear definition of what's going into what we call the New Testament. There's a lot of dispute. So at the time of Tertullian, there is no New Testament, per se. He just has a rule of faith, which is a statement of beliefs. And so later it becomes, all right, there's this set of books, there's this statement of faith. The Council of Nicaea defines and amplifies by committee a list of doctrines that you have to believe if you're straight thinking that is orthodox, and a list of books later that you have to accept if you're orthodox and the others don't belong. Mm -hmm. Orthodox um, New Testament simply meant the ones you read in church. Now, secret gospels were never meant to be read in church because a church invites outsiders to come and participate and believe in the gospel and be baptized. So what you put in the church, what you read from the front of the gathering, maybe it's in a house, somebody's you know, large house where everybody's gathered to worship. 
Somebody was going to read from the prophets. Somebody's going to read from the words of Jesus, from what they call the memoirs of the apostles. Um, and, and those are for beginners. So you wouldn't put the secret gospels in that New Testament canon because that's meant for beginners anyway. Hmm, this is interesting. Thank you so much. Mm.